Your focus now is to establish trust and to get them to be honest, to stop them telling you lies, which we all tell. Solicit their help. I wonder if you can help me. Would you say to, to, to anybody, if they said that to you, no, 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 I can't help you at all. You'd be polite to them, wouldn't you? Prepare the problems you fix. Still, after all the work that Neil Rackham did on spin selling and problem solving and wrote the book Spin Selling 70 years ago, still when I watch people sell, they're still selling the facts of what they are rather than the only reason your customers are buying from you, and that's to solve a problem. What key problems does your product or service fix? If you don't know, and I've got to say, sometimes a showstopper, you jolly well ought to sit down now, today, and work out a list of the problems you fix and talk about the big ones. And then when you, when you say the first, I wonder if you'd be open to hearing about the way we hit, fix that big problem, they'd be likely to be interested in. And always have one or two or three of these problems on the sheet in front of you. Now, if you've answered a couple of them, don't get into a sale on the phone. Always say to them, what would you like to do next? And if they ask you to send them something, send them an email, send them a brochure, say, yes, fine. Don't say, can I follow up with you in a couple of weeks' time? That's pretty obvious. That's what everybody says. Say, how would it be if I just check back with you in a couple of weeks to answer any queries you've got? When would be a good time or day for you to do that? And always use the standard alternative close. But you're not struggling with this anymore. They're much more open to telling you the truth. Any of you, if you've read the book, um, uh, what's it called, uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini. Have any of you read it? The Six Rules of Influence. If you can get somebody to say, yes, I will read your document when I get it, and they say that to you, they're 80% more likely to read it. If you can get them to read you say, if I send you something, you will read it, won't you? Put a little laugh in your voice. Yeah, I will. If they say, Oh, I don't know, I haven't really got time for it. I wouldn't bother to send them anything. And just say, look, I don't want to disturb your work day. Would it be okay if I rang you back again in a, in a month's time? I don't, want to, I don't want to increase the amount of stuff in their, in the, in, in their inbox, on their, on their email or in, the, in their post box. I don't want to do that. But you're giving the customer a chance to take control. And only go on. I mean, all good sales, you should only tell people about stuff they said they want to hear about. Only go on if they, if they say, yes, I'm open to hearing about the solution, the, pro the solution you've got to a typical problem that I have. Is there any engaging fit? The customer will tell you pretty quickly whether there is or not. That's all you're trying to do. You're trying to establish whether there is a fit between something you have to offer and something they want to fix. Let them be right. This is something um, you often hear with salespeople arguing with customers. Let the customer be right. He's not interested in hearing how right you are. Even when he's wrong, let him be right. Wouldn't it be a good idea if we did this? Yes, it would be. No problem, that isn't a problem. Hand them the next step. Let the customer make the decision about what they'd like to do next. It's not the standard, uh, when would you like to see me? next Wednesday at 2.30 or Friday at 4.15 type close, it's, you say to them, what would you like to do next? How would you like to progress this? It's a much more reasonable way of being called. Just imagine somebody said that to you when they're cold calling you at home or in the office. What would you like to do next, Mr. Jones? What would you like to do next, Mr. Buffett? How would you like to progress this? What would you like me to do? I promise you it is so different when you get round there you, eventually, hopefully, you will get an appointment, they always remark on it. That was a different sort of cold call. Certainly not the way I was taught to do it, but certainly the way I've been doing it for the last three years. And I'm only too pleased to pass it on to you. Establish trust, get them to be honest, then engage. Take the focus off trying to get the appointment and trying to sell them something, trying just to establish these things. That's all I want to talk to you about at this stage. The only question about the whole gamut of cold calling, which I've been doing for a very long time. Do you have any questions about the whole business of cold calling? It is much better, and the reason I asked one of my clients the other week why they were coming, why so many people now were suddenly interested in cold calling, people have quite honestly got fed up with hanging around LinkedIn all day hoping for a miracle. It's not happening, chaps. It's not that you shouldn't be on LinkedIn, you shouldn't be on social media, you shouldn't be on Facebook. 
But it's very much like setting out a shop, isn't it? Waiting for customers to come in. If we salespeople, we're supposed to be proactive, and this is the way of doing it. Question. So they say, if I like it, I get in touch. You say, fine, would it be okay? Still say, would it be okay if I just call back in the next couple of two or three weeks or so? And you never give up. I mean, the, the rules of selling are the rules of cold calling, and this goes back to traditional cold calling. People in general take six touches from you and your company before they'll do business with you. The first call, it doesn't register at all. All they're trying to do is get rid of you. The second time, they remember you called last time, and that's all they remember. The third time, they sort of might engage with you a bit more. But you've got to keep calling, and that sixth time they know who it is and they kind of work out in their head there might be something in it for them. You still call them back, because nothing stays the same. Persistent, nothing beats it. And very few salespeople make that fifth or sixth call. They've given up by then. Seriously. How do you get past gatekeepers? First of all, don't do what I was taught to do, be rude to them. And so he says, can you tell me what it's about? Uh, you know, it's a, this is what we were taught to do at Xerox. It's a business matter, I need to discuss with Mr. Head Honcho. Don't do that. Get them on your side, they're very powerful people. So when you, number one, try not to call at a time when she's gonna be there. When are gatekeepers most likely not gonna be there? Tell me. They're not there before half past eight in the morning. They're generally not there after quarter past six at night. They're very often uh, not there on Friday afternoon because the boss lets them go off, which is why I do most of my cold calling on Friday afternoons. And they're not there in bad weather. And the call then goes straight through to the person you like to talk to. If you have to talk to a, 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 a gatekeeper, you say, and they say, what is it about? You say something like this. Um, my name's Bob Edrington. My company's Bob Edrington Group. We are a sales training company. We've never done um, any work with PwC before. We'd like to change that. Can you tell me how to make contact? What would be the best way for me to talk to your boss? Put them on your side. But mainly, I try and avoid times where I'm going to get in, you no, know, they're going to get in the way. In bad weather, you see, the, the gatekeeper tends not to come in. Friday afternoons, they're not there. Friday afternoons are great for cold calling because very often the boss, the decision maker is there and everybody else is gone. It's the seat we all use. Get good cold calling. And even on weekends sometimes, if I've got somebody that I'm finding difficult to get through to, I put their number into my telephone, I ring them when I'm walking around Hyde Park or something. On a Sunday evening, they say, you're working late or something. They're used to it, they're there. Why can't you call them on a weekend if you've got their number? Any other questions about cold calling? It's what I do. I've made He's put a Bentley on my drive, giving me apartments in New York and London. That's what I do. I'm not cleverer than you. I just do some of this stuff. The secret is you've got to do it. If you don't do it, something dreadful will happen. Absolutely nothing. Pick up the telephone. Be honest. Engage them. And try and establish trust with them. Uh, the biggest turning point that turned on my cold calling was actually getting into um, one of the largest I used to work in New York City, one of the largest companies in, in Wall Street, because I, I rang the man at the top. My boss said, you're not getting much business in. I said, no, that's, 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 you're not getting much business in, you've got to do this. I, he said, you've got all these top companies in your patch, why don't you call them? I said, I'm not getting any. He said, you're calling too low down the pecking order. Why do most salespeople try and penetrate a company at middle management level. Why not? Why? Because it's easier. The trouble is, you go into that level, these people have got the power to say no, they haven't got the power to say yes. When you get to the top of the company, I've worked in New York for six years, and it's much easier there. People expect you to go and talk to the boss. In my day, Michael Eisner of Disney, he would take calls from salespeople. The richest guy I ever knew in New York had one of those Toblerone things on his desk with his name on the front of it, J. Walter Smith Jr. On the back, he pasted a bit of uh, masking tape with these words written on it that only he could see when he was looking at you. Maybe he's right. Huh? That's the sort of change that, that actually happens. Go to the top. Why, would, why are you not up there? Why are you dealing down there? These, these people at the top of companies, they're often not very pleasant, but God, do they make big decisions quickly. That's what I like. I don't want to waste time. I like selling Rolls Royces, not minutes. It takes too long. 
I've been doing it since 1970, and you can do it as well. I left school with one O level, that was it. I'm not, it's not about being clever, it's just about having the courage to do it. There's a lady on, uh, I'll to finish in just a minute. If you, how many of you haven't got the courage to cold call? Or lack courage? Okay, there's a lady on TED Talks, have you ever seen her, called Amy Cuddy? She's a professor of psychology from Harvard University. And she said, you absolutely test these, you know, is positive thinking, does it work? No, it doesn't. You know, does self-talk work very well? No, it doesn't. But there are things that do work, that, that could change things in two minutes. Anybody want to try one of them? So what powerful and engaging and, and brave people do, they're not braver than you and me, they're just brave for 10 minutes longer. They do a lot of making themselves bigger. And uh, when people win races at the Olympics, you notice that they come herring down the thing. When they cut through the, what, the, the ribbon, they do this. The amazing thing is that even blind people do it. who have never seen anybody do this. What the Paralympics, they do it as well. So when you're feeling elated and confident, you tend to make your body bigger. And she said the trick is, and she's tried it out in, uh, in America, the trick is to find out, before you have to do something you're scared of, like cold calling if you like, like going to see somebody that you're a bit frightened to see, go into a private office or in a room where you can't be seen, for two minutes, go into a power pose. She, said, she tested this stuff. She said that kids, you know, university graduates, going to interviews, if they have them, they, 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 they cut a group of them in half, and half of them, they, they don't tell them to do anything. Hardly half say, go away and do these power poses. When they analyzed the, the panel's decision afterwards about the people that came in, the ones they liked tended to be the ones who'd done the power posing beforehand. You're not in front of the customer being all laid back and big, but making your body bigger for two minutes. And if you can't do it, you're sitting in your car or something, just mentally doing it, imagining you're bigger, you feel, hey, and this is a very important thing. People recognize, before you've even opened your mouth and you go into a room, people feel this. Let me ask the ladies in the audience, because ladies like this. Ladies, if a strange man came into the back of the hall here now and just stood there smiling, how long in your female psyche would it take you to assess whether he was an alpha male leader type you could feel confident with? How long? You don't know who he is. It's a stranger. How long would it take you to make that assessment? How long? Take, men do it, but we take five times longer to do it. The real decision about whether people are going to buy from you, if you actually get to see them, is in the sound of your voice if it's on the telephone. But if you're going to meet them in the office, they make a decision subconsciously in the 15 seconds it takes you to walk from the door to his desk. So it's going to pay you to be, wow, not... You're not being stupid, but you just look a bit confident. Confidence is right now is what people will pay you for. Confidence and safety is what people are looking for. When IBM had a problem a few years ago with people digging holes around them, selling their cheaper uh, PC computers, they adopted the, 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 the tagline, nobody got fired for buying IBM. So it's more expensive, but hey, value for money. How do you keep up with the persistence? Number one, after your first, you, you never ever leave a meeting with the words, we'll let you know soon, ringing in your ears. You've lost control. Basically, they're just trying to be polite to you and they're really saying no. What you do is you, before you go into any meeting, you make up your mind, what is the minimum you want to walk out of this meeting with? What is the minimum commitment you want the customer to make when you leave? And you always say, right, that's, I was right down there, so I, let's say, I, being a train, running a training company, I'm often engaged by HR departments and training departments. I don't want to be stuck with them because they've got budgets. So I always make up my mind, say, you know, try and get to the next level. I say, you know, is there an HR director? Because could we involve him in the next meeting? It would be a good idea because this is going to be a pretty big issue. Um, if you've got arrange to see him maybe next Monday at 2.30 or Friday at 4.15, always get their commitment to take the next step. All the while, they are committing to you to take the next step, you still have control. The point at which you've lost control is where they say, we'll let you know soon. That's it. Huh? I still ring them up in two or three weeks' time. Eventually, you let them go. Oh, yes, you've got to persist. 
when I was a teenager in South London, there was a very pretty girl in our group. We never had a boyfriend. We none, of, none of us dared to talk to her. And finally, one of my friends was going out with her. They eventually got married and everything. We all said to him, how did you do it? He said, I kept asking her. Eventually, she said, yeah, that was the trick. You know, it, wasn't any, it wasn't better looking than the rest, but she kept on asking. That's what you've got to do. Because things, change, things always change in customers. No is not no forever. It's only no for the day. Go back. The worst thing you can do and the worst feeling you can have is when you eventually buck up courage to go back to somebody who you haven't heard from for a long time who says, oh, I forgot about you. If only you called us last week, you've got to be in part of the process. It's your job to persist. Nothing beats it. Not talent, not ability, and not education. Nothing. And most people don't persist. If I had one thing that I do as a salesman, I'm, I'm not pretty bright. I persist. Until they eventually say, oh, all right, then you can come in. And I foot in the door, and then I try my best to get up through the organization until the chairman or the managing director is somehow involved. If they get involved, believe me, they've got slush funds. They haven't got budgets. If you go in at a middle management level, it's very difficult to establish that relationship. So go in at the start, as high as, high as you can. Don't be afraid. I was in Hong Kong about five years ago, and the guy said, I've seen all these, uh, the customers I can in my territory. Uh, and I said, what about this building next door? It was a Bank of China building. And he said, oh, I can't ring. I said, ring the chairman of the Bank of China. Uh, what's he got to lose? He can only say no. And he came back after lunch, and he said, I've got, I've got to talk to you. I said, why? He said, I rang the chairman's office. I said, yeah. He said, the secretary's put an appointment in his diary. Now what do I do? Well, what are you afraid of? He has to put his trousers on one leg at a time in the morning like you do. Uh, he's not better than you. He just thinks differently. He's, when you get to the top of organizations, you realize they are not better than you. They just think in a different way. Richard Branson isn't better than you. Alan Sugar isn't better than you. Peter Jones isn't better than you. They think differently. They're not afraid. Or if they are afraid, they feel the fear and do it anyway. And that includes picking up the telephone. Any last questions? I, still, I keep doing this. I keep reti I've retired three times. The worst thing about retirement is no weekends. So I go back and start selling again. That's what I do. Thank you all very much. Very good. Thank you.